Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the EDH RecCast. Uh, once again, my name is Matt Morgan. I'll be leading us off today, and I am joined today by Dana Roach. Dana, how are you doing, bud? Um, I, I've been feeling kind of sentimental, actually. I was thinking about the last thing my grandfather said to me before I kicked the bucket, um, which was just, Dana, watch how far I can kick this bucket. Oh, my God. Um, it really kind of <laughs> hits hard if you think about it. It, it, it does. Uh, harder than the kick, actually, on exactly, the bucket right, itself. Exactly. He, so, he was old. He barely kicked it. He, he just tipped it over a little bit. <laughs> right, yeah. it, was, it was a mess to clean up. <laughs> Unimpressive for his final feat. Well, that's that's fair. Well, I'm, I'm sorry that it wasn't more eventful there. But we do have an episode to, to give everybody, give all the listeners. Joey's taken a little time off again this week. So here we are just taking everything. And we decided we had a very special and kind of on brand, actually, episode for everybody. Dana, what is our topic? Uh, today, we're going to be talking about some of the new legends um, from Dominar United then and now, the, the legends we saw back in the legend set and the new version of them. So legendary legends is what I'm hearing. Uh, some of them got a glow up and it's kind of worth talking about, I think. A, gl a, a glow up as the youths say? <laughs> yes, as the kids as the kids say. Awesome. Well, well good. I, I'm excited about this when you suggested it. I was... Uh, pretty intrigued and it made a lot of sense with some of the new designs that are coming out. Mm -hmm. So let's get into it. But first, we do have some shout outs and we want to get started with those. Uh, first, we'd like to thank Chase, aka Mana Curves, for their help with the post-production on the show. You can find them on Twitter at Mana Curves. And you can support the show directly over at patreon.com slash EDH RecCast, where we have patron tiers of all levels. Whether you want to join that amazing Discord community that we have going on, you want to see all the episodes a day early, historic challenge to stats picks. Dana doesn't look at those, but you can <laughs> over at EDH RecCast's patron page, which is at patreon.com slash EDH RecCast. And as always, we do have that very special shout out. So Zane Graybeal, you have the most wizardry name I think I've ever seen amongst our patrons. So we appreciate the support and thank you so much for being a patron of ours. Yeah, that definitely could have been a character in Baldur's Gate, I think for sure. Absolutely. We also might as well mention that uh, if you want a chance to play a game with all of us, the three of us are going to be at the Magic Summit November 11th through the 13th in Salt Lake City, Utah. So if you happen to be traversing through the uh, Utah desert and want to stop into Salt Lake and play a game of magic with us, we're going to be there. And as a bonus for listeners of the cast, you can use the code EDHREC at mtgsummit.com and that's going to get you 5% off all of your packages for the weekend. So whether you want the, the Kingdom's VIP Guild Pass or if you just want to get a ticket to the Command Zone, you still get 5% off even any of the 5K events they're doing for Legacy, Modern, any constructed events. It's going to be a huge event and any packages, any events that you want to do there that entire weekend, you'll get 5% off by going to mtgsummit.com and using the code EDHREC at checkout. It's going to be a fantastic time. All three of us will be there and we're looking forward to playing with everyone. Do you have any plans, Matt, to do any of those events or are you just going to be jamming Commander all weekend? I have been very tempted to dust off my old Modern Infect deck. I don't know if Infect is even good anymore in Modern, but it would be fun just to kind of roll the dice and see how that all goes. I, I think that would, I was actually debating bringing my, my Modern uh, Boggles deck too, just to see what happened. I would see how fast I can get blown out because I don't know if that's any good either and I have not updated it in a few years. So <laughs> I don't know where it even stands in the meta these days, but I was kind of de debating doing this same thing just for the fun of it. Yeah, I, I think it's safe to say I more than likely probably will be playing a lot of Commander that weekend, <laughs> hanging out with people. Uh, if you have any food recommendations, I also would love to hear that because that's my favorite part about these events is, is the gathering. We want to meet all of you. Uh, we definitely appreciate all the high fives, anything that we, we can get. So we're looking forward to it. Very cool. Well, should we jump into just talking about a few of these cards here? Yeah, we may as well. I mean, they are pretty legendary. Uh, and so let's just get into it. Yeah, it it's kind of, yeah, like you said, Dana, a glow up, as as you put it, happened to a lot of these commanders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a lot of nostalgia, at least particularly for me. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I'm so old, I played when Legends came out. Um, so I remember, like, the, the couple of Legends packs I was able to get my hands on back in the day, um, just seeing, like, cracking these open and seeing actual character names and seeing like the legend, even though they were bad and a lot of them were genuinely bad. <laughs> um, and not just as in like they didn't do anything, they were overcosted too. Like you were paying more than you'd pay for a craw worm um, it, to, to cast this, you know, vanilla creature. 
but it didn't matter. Like it was super cool. It was something like I hadn't seen in Magic before. You hadn't seen. They were the first multicolor cards. They were actual characters that felt like you were playing a D and D game. It was amazing. And so they've always really, for me, held this weird special place. And seeing new, actually cool playable versions of these um, has hit me in a nostalgia spot that has me so excited for this set that I, I, I am just I can't wait to crack some of these packs open. Yeah, I, I so to make you feel less old, I also remember playing with Legends cards, but I was 10. So okay. I, I, was, I wasn't quite as old. I, I didn't really grok what was going on. I was peak little kid opening packs sure. and just getting excited to, to be whatever. I was, I was the target audience back then. But it was a lot of fun. And, and it is very cool to see. I remember opening probably more packs of Chronicles just because those were cheaper. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of these legends were still in Chronicles. Like I remember opening yeah. a Marhelt Els Dragon card and I was, oh my gosh, this has a rampage. I'm going to be unstoppable. And there was just, it was a you're, fun you're, little thing to do. Yeah, and, and in fact, he was very stoppable, but. <laughs> he was very stoppable. Yes. <laughs> well, and, that's, well, yeah, that's going to be. Let's start kind of talking a... about Marhalt, right? That's probably a good place to start. Um the original Marhalt Elves Dragon, since, you know, no one probably has seen one in the magic table because, as we <laughs> said, he's very stoppable. Um, Marhalt is six mana, three red, red, and a green for a four, six with Rampage one. Um, and in Rampage, an ability that was uh, one of kind of the, the key words you saw legends up through, I think, roughly alliances. Um, whenever this creature becomes blocked, it gets plus one, plus one until the end of turn for each creature blocking it beyond the first. So if two creatures blocked your, blocked your creature, it got plus one, plus one. If three blocked it, it got plus two, plus two. It wasn't the most exciting ability, particularly Rampage 1. You know, if your creature had Rampage 2 or something, that might get a little bit bigger. But Rampage 1, not terribly effective for a 4-6 a that was kind of expensive to cast and didn't have any evasion. Yeah, it, well, and the interesting thing about it was like you kind of hinted towards Rampage had a number assigned to it. So you could have Rampage 3 and, and it would get even bigger. So Rampage 1 was kind of underwhelming. But thankfully, General Marhalt Els Dragon, which is the new version of this, kind of gives everything Rampage 3-ish, mm -hmm. something adjacent. So the new Mar General Marhalt is two, a green and a red. And whenever a creature you control becomes blocked, it gets plus three, plus three until end of turn for each creature blocking it. So right off the bat, the rate of which your, your creatures are gonna grow just gets so much better because it's plus three, plus three for each creature, not just for every creature beyond the first, if the sun is up right. <laughs> and it's a Thursday or however else Rampage worked. Yeah, it's, it's, it's for each blocker. So instead of like, Two creatures block your thing, block Marhalt himself, I guess, in the original one, and he got plus one, plus one. Now, if two block, we're up to plus six, plus six already because it's per creature, and it's not just Marhalt. It's whenever a creature you control becomes blocked. Um, so, so that rate there is much more interesting than Marhalt was, but it also has hooks in that first commander, right? That's what's really cool about this in a lot of these. You can see the through line. They didn't just say, okay, we're going to finally print a good version of these old cards. They actually looked back at the original card and found ways to make the new card look very much like the original and feel very much like the original. So while this new one doesn't have Rampage, it has a very Rampage-esque ability, and it's one that's very, very playable. Like, this is a legitimate deck. You, all your creatures that get blocked get buffed, which then, like, encourages you to do multiple things. The first thing that I want to do is run lure effects, run things like lure, which is an enchantment that makes um, your creature, makes all creatures have to block that creature. And there's multiple variants of lure over the years, uh, most of which are better than lure. Um, there's Nemesis <laughs> Mask, which is, a, which is an equipment, so it's reusable if the creature happens to die. Um, you look upon the Tarasque that is modular, it can be a fog, or it can give the creature plus five, plus five on indestructible. On top of then, you know, three or four or five creatures wind up blocking your creature. It's ginormous then at that point. You're, you're looking at like, you know, turning your creature into a 30-30. It's probably going to kill all the stuff that, that block it. And then what if you throw a Berserk on top of that? 
or throw a choose your weapon on top of that uh, spells that like double the power of your creature. So like you wait till it gets blocked by that lure effect and then hit it with that berserk or hit it with an unleash fury or something. Yeah, I absolutely thought of the exact same things. Lure effects, uh, Revenge of the Hunted is a good one. You look upon the Tarask is one of those new cards that you see that you're like, oh, this is going to be very, very good here. But also just slap an archetype of aggression into your general Marhalt deck. Yeah. Give all <laughs> yeah. of your creatures trample so that when they get blocked, not only do they get pumped up, but they also just, they plow over anything trying to block them. I think this deck is actually kind of fun, kind of spicy looking, uh, yeah. especially for an uncommon. That's the crazy thing about it. Like it used to be that legends were legendarily rare. It was, it, you didn't get to see one in every single pack. And now you get these at uncommon that are just these types of powerhouse decks that you're going to be building. Yeah, it's it's a powerhouse deck that's that's encouraging you to want your creatures to get blocked, which is a weird thing that nothing else is doing. Yeah, no, nobody wants to get blocked, but right. this does. Yeah, so so they found a way to like throw a callback into the original card to to make it a playable, brewable deck and make it an original, unique, playable, brewable deck. That's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's it's very cool, and this is a good example of just what we're going to get to talk about the rest of the episode. Yeah. Uh, so so one that I never actually opened myself that I do want to talk about because it I think this is probably one of the cooler ways that it, it improved upon the original design is Stang Echo Warrior. So the original Stang was four red and a green for a three, four that when it enters the battlefield, you created a Stang creature twin token uh, that would leave the battlefield if Stang left. And that was about it. it just made two, three, fours for six mana, which was a fine rate. But the new Stang, I'm I'm really digging. It's super fun. Uh, so Stang Echo Warrior is two a red and a green for a three, four again. But whenever Stang Echo Warrior attacks, you create a Stang Twin, a legendary three, four uh, token. That's a copy of it. It enters the battlefield tapped and attacking. And then for each aura and equipment attached to Stang, you create a token of that that is attached to the Stang Twin. And you sacrifice all the tokens uh, that you create this way at the beginning of the next end step. And that's a lot of words, but holy cow, Dana, I, this one gets me very excited. Yeah. Um, again, it, it's, it's this weird kind of unique thing. You, it took the original card that just made this secondary token, which by the way, at, the, at the, that point in time was pretty unique. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you didn't see very many tokens in the game. So seeing this second copy of this creature that came into play temporarily was a really kind of cool, unique ability, even if by today's standards, it wasn't a particularly impressive size body and, you know, no one was really brewing Stang. But we got a really cool throwback to it, and we got that throwback in a way that encourages you to brew that deck because the, the new Stang comes into play with, with copies of any auras and equipment that are attached to it also uh, as tokens on the twin that becomes much more threatening of an attacker. And maybe the most important part of this is you don't sacrifice any of those tokens till the beginning of the next end step, which means any subsequent combat steps that, that you happen to make, it's going to give you a chance to stack more staying equipment and, and auras especially. That, that is what I immediately went to when I first saw this. Uh, aggravated Assault. Seize the day. Any extra combat steps because the tokens go away at the beginning of the next end step, not at the end of combat. So if you have extra combats, you're able to essentially populate the whole battlefield with all these extra tokens and deal tons and tons of damage. I am very excited about that. And, and yeah, you know, the, the, the Stang Twin is legendary. So like you can't keep that on the field unless you have an effect that allows you to have like, remove the legendary ability like that, that's what you're going to run so running something like mirror box from the new kamigawa set is going to let those like legendary creatures additional stangs stack up for each combat step you also have cards like breath of fury that's going to <laughs> just yes. give you extra combat steps so you're going to be able to sacrifice that that copy of Stang. Oh my gosh, yeah. With Breath of Fury and put it on the new copy then. Yeah. So you can just chain extra swings then and not even have to worry about having your mirror box or something out. That That is some old tech, but that's absolutely true. Yeah, I, I, I love that. I just, all I can think about when I see the new art on Stang Echo Warrior is thinking if they ever do a magic movie, I would want Jeffrey Wright to play the new Stang because yeah. <laughs> seeing him in Westworld... Yep, I can see it's, just, that. It's, it's right there. Yeah. So what about you, Dana? What's what's something you're excited about? 
So I, I really like um, Zira, the Golden Sting. So so Zira Arian was was one of the original legends. Um, in John Colors actually quite efficiently costed three mana for a one two back then. That was not terrible. Um, Evasion had flying, um, Insect Wizard, and had an ability that you know while today's standards is kind of unimpressive. Back in the day, spending three mana and tapping a creature to draw a card wasn't nothing. Um, and, and at least it was an ability, unlike some of the some of the the, the vanillas. So uh, Zero Arian did see a little bit of play. The, the new one, however, um, you know, four mana, not three, but it's a three three with flying and haste, and has a really cool set of abilities. Whenever Zero the Golden Sting attacks, put an egg counter on another target creature without an egg counter on it, and when that creature dies, if it had an egg counter on it draw a card and create a 1-1 a one, one black insect creature token with flying. I mean, this one, it's so hard to process for me because my brain just doesn't think about this. But you also look at different decks like Mathis that played a lot of, played around with kind of the bounty hunter type mm -hmm. of, of strategy. And this applies here. So putting the counters on them, finding a way to kill them, assassinate them. Uh, the flavor for Zira is what I think stands out to me. But how I would build it, I have absolutely no clue. I mean, to start with, you are in green, so you have access to a couple of like token doublers. So you can really, you know, take extra advantage of of killing creatures and generating that token by generating multiples. Um, you have, you know, if you really want to like just look at a value engine, the Ozolith and Skull Clamp can do a lot of work here because you're not restricted to putting that counter onto just creatures your opponents control. So if you have something like, you say you've already made an insect creature token um, by killing something else, and you know you, you can just attack with that insect or whatever, um, put the counter on that insect, skull clamp it mm -hmm. to draw three cards in this case because of the skull clamp and the, the egg counter, move that counter onto your Ozolith, and next turn, put it back on another one of your creatures and do it all over again. Yeah. I'm, now, I'm not sure that you would get to draw a card for each uh, egg counter on those yes, creatures. Right. Yeah. You'd have to spread those around and do it off off the individual creatures You could because they, they wouldn't stack. Yeah. But it will let you at least reuse them in addition to putting new ones out there. Yeah. Well, And it's not like, too, we don't have several ways to manipulate and move counters around from different permanents to other ones. Yeah. There is a lot of play there. I do agree. I mean, and, and even at like a basic level, if you just wanted to run it as a Jund Insect Tribal Commander, there's plenty of insects in those colors, most of which have evasion. You're in green, so it's really easy to, you know, use like overruns and overwhelming stampede kind of cards as as, as kill conditions and just use, the, you don't even have to like go out of your way to abuse the egg counter thing. You can just use this as a piece of value. Occasionally, you'll put an egg counter on something and occasionally you'll kill it because it's convenient and occasionally you'll draw a card off it. You don't even have to be super, like, make a super complicated deck to just get value off it and just have it be an interesting brew. Yeah, I, you can do a lot of kind of Thantus the War Weaver whenever you took those decks into mm -hmm. kind of the insect tribal territory. There's a lot that you can do with because you're in the same colors even there. Yeah. I, I, I like that. Any ones that, that strike you as something super fun? Uh, well, I don't know about super fun, but I did mention... The, the Zira deck can play the assassinate, you know, put a counter on a bounty hunter type of stuff. So I feel like we need to get this one out of the way because it's caused the most stir in the community, I feel. And that is Ramsey's Assassin Lord, which is an actual human assassin. So the old Ramsey's Overdark was a big six mana Demir legend that had tap to destroy a creature that has an enchantment on it. So kind of assassinating creatures that are already locked down. It was a little weird, but the new one is something. I think that's a good way to put it, something. The, the new one is is four mana for a 4-4. Four, four. Um, it's a human assassin with death touch. Other assassins you control get plus one, plus one. And whenever a player loses the game, if they were attacked this turn by an assassin you control, you win the game. And the, that you win the game line seems yeah. <laughs> every time every time we see it on a card, yeah. uh, it, there, there's definitely a reaction. And, and it's been very mixed depending on kind of what power levels that you typically like to play at uh, is my observation. But that's purely my observation. Yeah, I, I do think it's definitely a thing that can and, and will be played at high power levels, I would imagine. Um, but I, I don't think it's one of those cards that is necessarily warping if you're not playing at that power level. I do think you could play play Ramsey's at a lower power level at a kind of a more um, casual style table and 
not necessarily have a problem with it. Like at that point, people tend to not be playing, you know, crazy effects that that are going to make it super easy to abuse. So at that point, you're just like, people have to watch out if they take lethal. If someone's going to take lethal damage from an assassin on your on, on your team, people have to be prepared that that's going to kind of kill everyone. But that's that's a, a an effect we do kind of already see with Kedis Embercaw Familiar, where damage your commander deals gets dealt to everyone. Well, for the most part, when people are using a Kedis kind of card, it's to kill everyone simultaneously. It, it will, in a casual table, this will kind of work that way, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. And it gives people a chance to play a tribal deck, which people tend to love doing. That's a really popular theme, one of the most popular ones in EDH Rec. And we haven't had anything that really is wanting you to run assassins. Well, now we do. And I think also there's going to be a good opportunity to play Xenograft in this deck where you're just going to be able to make all of your creatures assassins. For sure. But also, I, I'm kind of excited that some cards that I think people maybe were a little hopeful for that never panned out are going to get a chance to to fit in thematically. Stuff like Atrata the Silencer. I remember when people first saw that card, it says you win the game. So, or, well, player loses the game, I should say. So it was... Kind of people wondering, ah, I don't know about this, but it, it turns out it was nothing. It's, it's it's a 50 cent card. But now you actually get to play it in a Ramsey's deck where it's going to make sense. Is there potential for it to get abused? Absolutely. But also that means you're playing a lot of tutors. The deck's probably going to get pricey pretty quick if that's what you want to do, which I think and I'm hoping will keep that in check from being too badly abused. That's my guess as well. I, I think this is the kind of card that you... Might well see at those tables people want to play that way. And I think you're just going to see people playing it in kitchen table because they want to play Royal Assassin in their deck and have a beyond theme for their tribe. And I think that's great when when Watsi can print cards that appeal to both of those player bases. Yeah, have, having that flexibility is always a solid, solid plan that that the design team has been kind of working in there. There is potential to get busted, but there's still a lot of people that are enjoying it just the way that it is. So it's another legend that you're kind of getting excited about then. This is this is one that I, I again I found to be a really clever bit of design and a really clever callback. Um Lady Ecolaria was seven mana back in the day for a three six <laughs> in, in Slesnia colors. Tap her to do three damage to target attacking or blocking creature. That's okay. That was kind of an ability you would see, particularly back in the day. And and she's an archer on the card. There's clearly her holding a bow, so that ability is kind of calling to that. And then we would see roughly around that time period in subsequent sets, they would give that ability to archers. So like, you know, various archer cards would have tap to do one damage to an attacking or blocking creature, tap to do two damage, whatever. They oftentimes got reach. She didn't have it then. The new one does now. Yeah. And, and the abilities, it's kind of what modern design has turned, like what Lady Calaria would be like obviously, if she were designed now. Um, So she does have that reach, like you mentioned, but she also reads to untap all archers you control during each other player's untap step. So you're able to tap them to do a lot of attacking or dealing damage to to creatures that are attacking and blocking. But she also reads, whenever an archer you control deals damage to a creature, you may pay two mana. And if you do, you draw a card. So she's got a little bit of an engine built right into her. And I am very impressed, actually, with the the design of Ohabi Calaria. Yeah, it, it's a great design. And again, that it calls back to the original and it gives us something unique. There's nothing in Magic right now that's wanting you to run a bunch of archers, particularly ones that have tap abilities that probably look like her original tap ability where you do damage to an attacking or blocking creature. So we have this deck here where it's going to encourage you to run archers and probably ones that tap to deal damage to attacking or blocking creatures. So now you have this wall. People have to consider, okay, if if I attack this player, my my creature's going to take six or eight damage or something. And then so does the next person. It's not even like a situation where you can use it up and then the person's vulnerable because their creatures are going to untap during each other player's untap step. That That's just really weird and interesting. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. And the one thing that I think you want to do when you're building this deck, because if you have probably three or four archers on the battlefield, people are just going to be totally, you know, disincentivized to be attacking because it's just going to get mowed down. So playing some provoke effects, cards that are going to force combat to be happening. There are a few ways in Selesnya to do that. It's mostly with artifacts, but provoking creatures to have to attack is going to be the best way to, to mow down their battlefield because... If their creatures have to be attacking, 
then that gives you the opportunity to be poking them down and, and killing their creatures. You know, if you wanted to take the next step when you brew this deck, if you assume people are going to not attack you or you want to f- make them force them to make that decision, you can run things like Crypto with Rights or mm-hmm. if you happen to own an old copy of Earthcraft, which is now crazy expensive, <laughs> it gives you something else to do with your creatures if people don't attack you. Oh, you're not going to attack me? Well, then I'm going to tap m- a couple of these creatures to generate some mana to cast a couple instant spells and then that'll all reset the next player's turn. So you can not attack me because you don't want to lose your creatures and I'm just going to gain extra value from all of those bodies by using that Crypto with the Rights to untap my lands to cast some instant spells. Crypto the Thrite is a solid card. More news here at 11 yeah. on the EDH Trek <laughs> we, news, we, news Network. We found a way to make Crypto with Thrite and Earthcraft <laughs> playable. Yay on us. Uh, well, I, well, one thing that I think we need to find a way to, to, to be playable is challenge the stats. And I know I forced that segue super. It was ramshackled is a word that I would use. So why don't we jump to challenge the stats then? Because we do have some more legends that we want to talk about. We do. We don't have all the list quite yet, but we... There's, there's some more of this stuff that we want to talk about. So let's challenge some stats and then we'll get back to it. Hey everyone, wanted to let you know that this week's Challenge the Stats is sponsored by Manscaped, the leader in below the belt grooming. I will fully admit I listened to a ton of podcasts and I'd always heard Manscaped ads and I was always very skeptical about them. But uh, yeah, no, this is the best razor I've ever owned. <laughs> they have this lawnmower 4.0 trimmer that features a cutting edge ceramic blade to help reduce grooming accidents. And that's a big deal. I'm... Yeah, I'm officially a convert now. I was amazed at how well the razor helps reduce nicks and stuff like that. And it's even waterproof. Like, you can use it in the shower. What? It's really cool. I admit, you know, I was skeptical. But honestly, I was actually just late to the party. Because there are more than 6 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped. Everyone likes to feel fresh and well-groomed, you know? And for our listeners, they've given us a special promo code just for you. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code EDH at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code EDH at manscaped.com. Keep things smooth and fresh as we say sayonara to smooth ball summer and enter fresh ball fall. Thank you again to Manscaped for sponsoring the show. Okay, first up here, um, my challenge, I kind of teased on Twitter because I, I, I wound up posting a little bit about this card a couple weeks back. Um, Elkin Lair is an old card. It's, a, it's, it's so old, it's a world enchantment, not just an enchantment, for three and a red. At the beginning of each player's upkeep, that player exiles a card at random from their hand. That player may play the, that card this turn, at the beginning of the next end step, if the player hasn't played that card, they put it into their graveyard. Um, it's on the reserve list, so it's not nothing to purchase one, but I actually picked one up at my local shop this week for $3 for a deck, so it's relatively affordable. Um, it's only in 524 decks in EDH Rec, and you definitely don't want to just be adding it to your deck willy-nilly because... It just forces an impulse draw for everyone, and you're going to occasionally get burned by that by having a card get exiled to the impulse that you don't want to play just then. However, if you are playing a deck like Prosper Tome Bound or Faldorn Dreadwolf Herald, where you get rewarded for casting things from impulse as an impulse draw, or in the case of Faldhorn, even if you play a land from exile like that, then it becomes almost all upside. Yes, on occasion, you're going to hit your Chaos Warp or something that you don't want to use just now, and you're going to have to, to, to burn it. But you're still going to get the extra bonus for that. It's a way to turn your normal draw into a way to generate the wolf from Foulhorn, for the, the, the treasure from Prosper or something. Meanwhile, everyone else is going to get no bonus from it, and they are going to just be entirely inconvenienced. It's not an amazing card outside of those kind of decks, but in those kind of decks, I think it definitely needs to see more play in a deck that rewards you for casting stuff from out out of exile like Thaldhorn or Prosper. Yeah, leave it to Dana to find something that's not great anywhere except a very niche (laughs) area. So good on you. So my challenge this week is Hoarders Agreed, which was sent to us by Chad Haverkamp. They sent us an email, which you can do at edhretcast at gmail.com. But they said, have you guys ever heard of this card in an EDH game only being played in 261 decks and all you need to do is just win one clash and it's well above rate? 
Hoarder's Greed, which is three and a black for a sorcery that says you lose two life and draw two cards. So you get to read the bones type of effect. You get to get your Knight's Whisper. Dane is going to love this card. So you get to do that. You get to lose the two life, draw the two cards, and then you clash with an, with an opponent. And if you win the clash, you repeat this process. And the clash is that you and the, the clashing player reveal a top card of your library. And then whoever has the higher CMC wins the clash. And then you put that card on the top or the bottom of your library. Chad points out that you can repeat this process in top deck manipulation decks because you can set up to make sure that you have the highest CMC card. It's going to be revealed so you get to reveal that and get to repeat this process over and over again. And the errata text on Hoarder's Greed does point out that this process does not stop. You, you have to lose a clash in order to stop this from happening. And if you're playing top deck manipulation, chances are you have a lot of very high CMC things. If you're playing Aminatu, the Fate Shifter, for example, or any type of card that likes to have big creatures to cheat out, this is going to be great. So, Chad, this is a great challenge. We definitely appreciate the email. And yes, this is a great card in those top deck manipulation decks because you are able to draw quite a few cards with this. Nice challenge. Let's talk a little more about some of these uh, glow ups on the OG legends, the, the cool new versions, and, and compare them with the old ones and see which ones are excited to us. What are you liking here, Matt? So I'm going to go from one archer to another, actually. Uh, so Tor Wauki. I believe I'm saying that right, who knows, uh, was one that was a human archer back in the original printings that could just tap to deal two damage to an attacking or blocking creature. But the new one, Torwauki the Younger, there's a lot of really fun things going on there that I, I'm excited for. So it's still a human archer, still, th uh, still a 3-3 with reach and lifelink. And if another source you control would deal non-combat damage to a permanent or a player, it deals that much damage plus one to that permanent or player instead. But the real fun thing is whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, Torwauki the Younger deals two damage to any target. So there's so much fun stuff you can do with those two lines of text. Yeah, this was a card where, you know, similar to the Lady Calaria, that, which had a very, very similar ability, um, they obviously didn't want to go that same route here and, and do something with archers in particular, because number one, there's not a ton of archers in, in Rakdos colors. Um, and, and that would have been, you know, they, why do something similar to what they already did? Um, I guess they could have had Tor do, you know, something with the sweet mesh tank top he's wearing in his original art. <laughs> I'm not sure what that would be, but it's, it's a look that has definitely stood the test of time, I suppose, particularly with the red gloves. That guy has... Fashion forward Torwaki. Torwaki looks like he stole the gloves from Kinky Boots and turned yeah. stole the boots, <laughs> yeah. turned them into gloves, and that's that's yeah. how they roll. But the, the new ability, like, there's so much cool stuff immediately. Just because Tor has lifelink, I immediately thought of Chandra's Ignition. Yes. That just right off the bat is just, oh, I'm gonna watch the world burn, but also I'm gonna gain a bunch of life. Yeah, they, they it, it took the 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 tap to do damage to an attacking or blocking creature, which was not combat damage, and they just made Tor lean into doing non-combat damage to things and rewarding you for doing that. So again, it was it was a they they took the same ability on Lady Claria and found a way to do something totally different while also still throwing back to that original archer ability. I mean, and I really like token builds here, not just because you know you can play Perforos God of the Forge and Impact Tremors to trigger that a lot. But also you can play a lot of the, the goblin creating spells like Empty the Warrens and those types of spells that are going to trigger the cast and sort of sorcery ability that Tor has, but also it's going to trigger the impact tremors that's going to get souped up. So there's a lot of really just powerful synergies you can kind of build into this Tor deck that you don't get to do normally in Rakdos colors. Yeah, it, it's, it's a very kind of red-blue feeling deck in Rakdos that still they've still found a way to make it feel on theme. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So what, what about you? We'll, we'll, we'll let you pick another commander to talk about here. Um, you know, this one is, I think, the first true vanilla creature we've talked about. Um, Savitri Skarzen. Um, back in the day, Savitri is a seven mana vanilla 6-4. Uh, the most notable thing about the card is some pretty rad art. Um, Savitri is just riding a dragon, and that's it. Savitri is a... Human riding a dragon, 6-4 vanilla for 7 mana. Nothing exciting about that. Um, now, Savitri does get mentioned in the lore if you're someone who digs back through the old books. 
Savici was a, a planeswalker um, and was kind of a, a dragon-based planeswalker. So they decided to actually just make a planeswalker card for Savitri. Yeah, so the new Savitri comes in being two and Demir colors, so still a blue and a black, for a four starting loyalty planeswalker that has a plus one ability of until your next turn, creatures can't attack you or planeswalkers you control unless their controller pays two life for each of those creatures. So it's kind of a Norn's Annex type of effect right there. Mm -hmm. uh, also has a minus three ability to search your library for a dragon card, reveal it, put it in your hand, and then shuffle. So pretty straightforward, tutor for a dragon. But then the minus seven ability is where you get to destroy all non-dragon creatures. That's just going to be just plain effective right there. And also Savitri Dragon Master can be your commander. That's a, a returned ability that we see that we don't get very often. So so very clearly here we have, and, and this is, as a throwback is much more a lore throwback necessarily than like a throwback to the original card. But it's a logical war throwback. It, it, Savitri was a planeswalker, did care about dragons. So here we have a, you know, dragon centric planeswalker in Demir that is encouraging you, if it's your commander, to kind of build dragon tribal. That's, again, not something for the most part we've seen. And I say that as someone who actually has a Demir dragon tribal deck um, under Silumgar the Drifting Death. But like that's just me wanting to be. Uh, a hipster and builds, you know, Demir dragons. <laughs> uh, outside of that, there's really not a, a lot of of things in that color pair encouraging you to do that. But and now there is. So if you are somebody who like is always wanted a dragon deck, but like oh, but they 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 all look too similar. Well, here's your chance to build one in colors that don't traditionally play with dragon tribal, and also to do it in kind of a in a way that isn't necessarily busted, like. This is useful. It's going to protect itself. It's going to, you know, if you want the option to tutor up a dragon, you can do that. But you're in colors that have access to pretty good tutors anyway. It It's a relatively fair commander that's going to let you build a dragon tribal deck and, and, and do it in a way that's going to be able to play at casual tables and not feel like you're doing something that no one else can deal with. It's just a really middle of the road, fun, interesting, cool design. And I'm a big fan of it. Yeah, one of the perks of using the the original vanilla legends like Savitri Scarzum is that you have a blank slate with the new car. So you can really do whatever you want. Yes. And so they used it to fill some gaps that I, I noticed yeah. uh, amongst other legends that they kind of did this with. And Savitri, this is a it's perfectly playable at various power levels in being your commander. That's that's a fun thing that I like seeing is absolutely it's not it's it's a planeswalker and planeswalkers are very hard to balance in the command zone. So props to the design team for finding one that you can put in the command zone that isn't going to be downright oppressive. It's not going to be super super busted push out other commanders. Mm -hmm. It's filling a design space that wasn't filled before, and that's what I really love seeing with this specifically because they're. They had a blank slate. They did, had a vanilla card before. And so they used that as an opportunity mm -hmm. to fill something that needed to be filled. And I, I just, I really appreciate that move. And, and to touch on the design briefly too, it's also a pretty good design for a, a, a Demir Dragon Tribal Commander in part because most of the dragons that are worth playing in Demir Colors are relatively expensive. Um, you know, dragons in general tend to be, but like the red ones are a little more aggressively costed and... There's some decent cheaper red dragons, or if you just want to round out your curve, there's dragon whelp-esque cards in red that if you want to be able to put bodies on the field as you build up to casting those giant six and seven drop beaters, you can still put out bodies that, that will be useful later on and will interplay with the dragon tribal stuff you're doing. That's not really a thing in black and in blue necessarily. So what you have here is a commander that you can drop uh, on, on turn four that is going to protect itself a little bit and protect you while you then get yourself up to that point to cast those six and seven drops that are the powerful dragons in that th this color pair. So it's a, it's a clever bit of design in terms of how it actually interacts with the deck as well. Yeah, the, the Norn's Annex ability. I, I've always loved playing Norn's Annex to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so finding that in other colors, just how can they play around with that? Yeah. I, I like that. I think it's a very powerful ability, but it's absolutely just not broken unless you're absolutely. playing a token deck. Then in, in that case, you're very, very sad. Yeah. All right, Matt. So th that was my, my cool throwback to back in the day. That's like a personal one for me. What do you have here? Well, another one that is it was a vanilla creature before, and now it... it 
I, I see some potential there, but I'm also not quite sure what to make of it. It's going to be the Lady Orca, or now Orca the Siege Demon. So before it was just Lady Orca, which was seven mana for a 7-4. As we're seeing, these seven mana, yeah, not really impressive creatures. But the new one, I'm actually kind of intrigued with because it, I see some potential in kind of the line, along the lines of your Jury Master the Review deck. Yeah, um, the, the new one definitely is is pointing in a direction, and you didn't have that with 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 the vanilla creature at all. In this case, we have a five five for for seven mana again, but it's a five five with trample. And whenever another creature dies, put a plus one counter on Orca Siege Demon. That's that's another creature. Period. Your creature, other people's creatures, tokens. It does not matter. When Orca dies, it deals damage equal to its power divided as you choose among any number of targets. So, you know, I play a Jury Master the review deck, as Matt said, when Jury dies, it deals damage to a single target. So I have to find ways to either redo that multiple times or copy that that triggered ability. Um, in this case, if you can get Orca big enough, you can just kill everybody. Well, I still think that you're going to be playing the cards that are going to copy that ability. Probably. I, I, pro- yeah. Don't call me crazy. But I like that, that there's flexibility, whereas Jury, you kind of had to go, Yeah, you just had to go big. Yep. This one, you don't feel bad about only getting six or seven because you're probably still going to be able to pick off a few different threats around the table. Mm-hmm. So there's a little bit of flexibility there, but I just, it's fun seeing how they're they're playing around with design space, not copying over things, but there's there's obvious inspiration, but also like the, the flavor text it was it, it the old flavor text on Lady Orca kind of alludes to the design here, and so it's just it's very very cool that they're going up and big with the the demon flavor too. Yeah, even finding a way to be inspired by flavor text, using that for the launching point, just fantastic stuff, and really makes this this set feel like it has a lot of depth. Not that magic sets don't, but like this one especially feels deep. Well, and. It's also cool that not just from flavor text, but they took inspiration from the old art on cards. So the yes. next one I, I do want to bring up is going to be Aisha Tanaka. So the original one was Azorius. It was white, white, blue, blue for a 2-2 with banding, which they've also kind of tried to fix in the new set. Yeah. with uh, And list is the new ability. But the new one, Aisha Tanaka Armorer. So that's going to be three, a blue and a white for a two, four that says whenever a Yisha Tanaka armor attacks, you look at the top four cards, of your library, you may put any number of artifact cards with mana value less than or equal to Aisha's power among them onto the battlefield tapped. And then you put the rest of them on the bottom of your library in a random order. And then Aisha can't be blocked as long as defending player controls three or more artifacts. So she's basically going to be unblockable in 75% of the games anyways. Right. But yeah. that that first ability seems very, very fun. There's a deck building challenge right there. And, and it's one of those things that like becomes a game. Mm-hmm. You, you're going to get those equipment and equip Aisha with those equipment, which will then increase her power. And the next time you attack, it's going to let you dig deeper and find you know something else. And contain, like you're going to have this cycle where every time that successfully happens – the effect becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. Yeah. And the fact that it's any number of those cards too, that's where yeah. I think this is going to get very, very powerful because you can sneak in some very powerful and very big things mm-hmm. and Aisha's going to pick them up and run with them. And, and again, we're looking at something that makes sense in, in the context of the original card and it's doing something kind of unique. We're not, we, we don't really have things that care about equipment like that in Azorius necessarily. And now we do. We have this this commander that's going to encourage you to kind of build Azorius equipment. The old art on Aisha just with this a big suit of armor mech thing yeah. hanging out there. It, it, you can see the inspiration where it came from because yep. she's taken that armor and, and suiting herself up with all of it. So Dana, what is the next card you want to talk about? So probably the most played or at least one of the two most played of these original batches of legends would be... Hazazan Tamar, um, seven mana, so that's a lot, um, four red, white, and green for a 2-4. At the beginning of your upkeep, if Hazazan Tamar entered the battlefield since the beginning of your last upkeep, put a 1-1 one, one red, green, and white sand warrior creature token onto the battlefield for each land you control. 
Those creatures have, when a permanent name Hazaz and Tamar is in the battlefield, exile this creature. So, you know, particularly because you're playing in green, you're probably doing a lot of your ramp via lands. So there's a pretty decent chance when you actually cast Hazazan, you're just making seven tokens. Mm-hmm. That's that's pretty effective, even though it's seven mana. Yeah, even at seven mana, I mean, if you have seven lanes in play, that means you get seven tokens. Exactly. So it it yeah, it's it's very very easy to get carried away with that. But thankfully, the new Hazazan is a little more a little more toned. So yes. this one we're only seeing three mana, but still Naya, so a red, a green, and a white. For a 3-3 human warrior with Desert Walk, which is an ability we don't see very often, the, the, the land walk abilities. So this one is, this creature can't be blocked as long as defending player controls a desert. Sometimes you'll see Island Walk on Merfolk or, or Forest Walk, whatever. So, Hazazon Shaper of Sand also reads, you may play desert lands from your graveyard. And if you remember back from Amaket Block, you're able to sacrifice deserts to get any sort of ability. And then also, whenever a desert enters the battlefield under your control, you create two 1-1 one, one red, green, and white sand warrior creature tokens. So you're able to have that engine of playing lands, play, playing deserts specifically from your graveyard, but also getting benefit from that. And then you also want to sacrifice those deserts and st- just keep that cycle going. Yeah, it's a card where they've taken the original, you know, making sand creature tokens and letting you still continue to make those sand warriors that that carried over it still cares about lands in some way although in this case it's deserts and the flavors there has they done very much looks like a desert warrior you're making sand warrior tokens so in this case they took inspiration both from what the card did and from what it looked like and this again is a really interesting commander that cares about deserts and hey, you just so happen to be in green where you have access to cards like Crop Rotation or Harrow that will put a land you control into your graveyard. In this case, probably, hopefully a desert. It will let you go get lands then from your library and it will let you then replay that desert that you just put in your graveyard with Season's ability and create some Sand Warrior tokens in the process. And what do you know? You're in colors that have access to Doubling Season and Parallel Lives and Anointed Procession to make multiple copies of those tokens. This is going to be a very powerful commander that people are going to do a lot of cool stuff with, and they're going to play a bunch of weird, bad deserts along the way, and uh, that's amazing. Well, yeah, the, the the pool, as well, not the pool, I should say, the cards that you are able to play, because there aren't very many pools in a desert, silly Matthew. True. <laughs> uh, so there's only 16 cards that are deserts that you can play in the new Hazazon decks. Uh, not all of them are good. Some of them you're able actually to get into the graveyard. Uh, we did have Just back, all on their own. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. They have the cycling ability so you can pay a couple mana, uh, discard it, and then you get to draw a card. So there, there is a little bit of benefit. There's ways to get the deserts into the graveyard, but a lot of these deserts are also, they only produce colorless mana. So if you're playing, you know, 12 utility lands there that aren't able to make colored mana, it's going to be a little tight. So there is a deck building challenge there right off the bat. Yep. I do want to point out, since Joey's not here and we can say whatever we want now, uh, Scavenger Grounds is a desert, folks. Yes. So yes. if you want to get it into your graveyard, then replay it. You can't loop it, unfortunately, because you have to sacrifice the Scavenger Grounds and then the ability goes off. So it's going to be in your graveyard. It's going to exile itself. I'm sorry. We can't abuse that. Yeah. But that doesn't mean there's not just a lot going on there that you can play around with. And we're trusting all of you out there to not tell Joey we were talking about Scavenger Grounds on this show. Do not tell Joey. That's that's bet- just between us. Yes. We are a little secret. <laughs> yeah. So that that's the last big one I had here, Matt. Is there are there any final ones you want to touch on? Uh not really. Nothing specific. But th- that doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of fun ones. Like we, yes. we saw the new Tetsuo Umazawa. Th- that one is it's new ground. We get the first Grixis kind of voltron type of commander there. Uh, Rasputin Oneromancer. Who, who knew what the old one did? It was a combo <laughs> deck apparently, but this one makes a little bit more sense. Easier to understand. It, it's cool what they did with all of these. And, and I appreciate and I'm glad this is something that we get to see because so many people loved the characters or they wanted to yeah. revisit the characters. And this is a chance for us to do that. Yeah, th- I, I kind of mentioned this on, on my Commander Central show, but I, but I'll, it's worth mentioning here again. A lot of these really feel like kind of a labor of love. And, and not that – I don't want to disparage general magic design in, in other sets. I'm sure these the, the designers put plenty of thought um, into the, the creatures they design. 
But these really feel like people put a lot of time and energy and thought into making these. I, I, I know there's definitely a deadline and there's a limited amount of time you have to think about these kind of things, but this really feels like they they gave everyone like, hey, pick your favorite old legend card and spend some time really thinking about what a cool new version of that would look like. It really feels like people did just spend a significant amount of time in design finding ways to call back to these and make cool new ones in a way that I don't know if they're able to generally do with most sets. And it it shines through here how much it feels like the designers loved making these cards. I, I, I it really, the, the quality really feels like it's there. And I, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm glad that the designers feel like they love a lot of these cards the same way I do. Yeah, it, it definitely feels like some of the the paper boomers as we are. Yeah, uh, th they sure. had a chance to. I, I like that point that you said, mm -hmm. Dana, where they were given the assignment of find your favorite legendary card from Legends and redesign it. Make make do it justice this time. Yeah, well, like, I really like, think they did. Like like you know why is Jedet Ohanan mercenary in band colors? Well, so you can run both the previous Jedet Ohanans. That's a good enough reason. <laughs> like that's a that's a like yeah. what a great reason to do that. So you can run the original Azorius one from Legends and the green one from back in Time Spiral Block. Perfect. That's a perfect reason to do things like that in this kind of set. Yeah, and it's so cool just to like the new Jasmine Boreal, how it takes care of all of your vanilla creatures. It it helps juice them yeah. up because the original Jasmine Boreal was a vanilla creature. And you can you can run the old one in your new deck and have her being a vanilla creature mean something. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's 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 just a fun thing that they're able to do to really tie in because mm -hmm. it's sometimes it feels like you either like the old magic or, or new magic. And this is a way to tie everything together and really bring people together. And that's yes. it's a very cool thing that I, I feel like we don't get to see very often. And so when it does, no, yeah, we sh it should be celebrated. And as much as we're going to be called, you know, shills for Watsi, um, <laughs> yeah. I'd love to be paid for saying these opinions, but I, I, I credit it, credit is due here. So, yeah, this this is the perfect amount of fan service for me. It's hitting me where I want. And I, um, I appreciate it and I, I'm, I'm thankful for these great designs and I'm I'm excited about the set in the way I have not been excited about a set in a long time. Yeah, we we definitely, ha you and I especially, mm -hmm. Joey maybe missed the boat a little bit, a little but bit young. I am, the, the next few sets here, I'm very excited for. Just getting back to Magic when I first started playing, The Brothers War, I remember reading oh, that cycle yes. of books. I, I am very excited to see what they do because as it's been pitched so far, it's, the brothers or the book as it's happening versus antiquities the set was kind of looking back as like a mm -hmm. history book so it's it's cool and i'm i'm excited for the these next few months absolutely of previews of the new cards the story all of that yeah uh, um yes they have got me hyped in a way that i i was not expecting um and i am i'm 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 genuinely excited for for magic right now this is a fun time to be playing so um, th this set has been amazing to look at so far, and I can't wait to see what else they have in store for us throughout the rest of this cycle. Well, I mean, Kevin Feige did present the new graphic. <laughs> Not yeah. really. He didn't, he didn't actually folks, but the, yes. the new, the new upcoming sets, it, it, has, it has some hints of, of, of the Marvel cinematic yeah. universe. So. Yeah, very much so. Well, but before we say too many things that people are going to take out of context right. and <laughs> pretend that Kevin Feige is making magic movies. Let's wrap it up. Let's, let's, let's get out of here. So where can everybody find you on social media, Dana? You can find me on the Twitter birds at Dana Roach. You can hear me on other podcasts, CMDR Central. I'm writing articles for EDH Rec and Commander's Herald, and you can find all of us together at patreon.com slash EDH Recast. And I'm Matt Morgan. You can find me on Twitter at Mathemus55. That's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. And don't forget, Wednesday evenings, we are streaming over at twitch.tv slash EDH Retcast. We play games every single Wednesday evening. We have guests on. It's always a super fun time. So make sure you tune in for all of that. And don't forget, you can find Joey still. He's still on social media. You can find him at Joseph M. Schultz on Twitter. You can find Chase at Mana Curves, who also helps with the, the post-production of the show. There's so many things that they do behind the scenes, and we definitely appreciate all of their hard work. But with all of that said, we are going to wrap it up here. So thank you, Dana, for doing this. This was good. Nice little trip down memory lane. This was. This was, yeah. our, this, well, this, this was the paper boomer uh, legends the, podcast, <laughs> but that was a fun thing to do for sure. 
the the paper boomer episode indeed yes but until then yeah everybody have a good week we'll see you at the magic summit so make sure you head over there as well use the code edhrec when you check out if you want to go otherwise we'll see you all next week so make sure as joey loves to say make sure to edh wreck your deck before you wreck your deck <laughs>